it's now my great pleasure uh, to uh, invite Dr. Nandini Ghosh, professor, assistant professor of sociology at the Institute of Development Studies in Calcutta, India. And she has uh, presents a reflexive approach on safeguarding and protection of children with disabilities within institutions in India. <clears throat> the floor is yours. Hello, yeah. Um, I uh, am going to be speaking about experiences from India, and uh, they are vastly different from uh, the experiences that we have been hearing about. And I'm sure it's going to resonate with the experiences of a lot of the people who have come from the third world countries, because we are more communitarian societies, and the way that uh, you know, just before this, when we hear about the Royal Commission in Australia, the way that uh, the state in Australia takes responsibility towards framing uh, uh, policies uh, is not something that happens in our countries in uh, the same manner. So uh, I will be talking primarily about uh, how, uh, uh, because of certain violation of the child rights, uh, uh, policies in terms of disabled children, how a group of activists and advocates got together to uh, work towards framing guidelines. And this was a completely non-state-sponsored uh, initiative, which made it significant. It was very local, uh, but there were problems in it, and that's what I'm going to reflect on. So um, as, as we all know, the child rights discourse has been shaped by the UNCRC, and we've been talking about it. And UNICEF also talks about how state parties have to take uh, responsibility for uh, protection and care uh, necessary for children's well-being. And UNICEF particularly, uh, in consonance with the UNCRC, talks about how uh, state should direct the institutions, services, and facilities responsible for care and protection of children to conform to the standards established by competent authorities. And there should be monitoring. Yet the UNICEF data itself assumes that there is one million children who experience violence and abuse every year. So uh, we've been hearing about child protection, child abuse a lot, so I will not go into the definitions. But basically, if we look at the discourses around safeguarding and protecting of children, uh, we see that these are mainly legal uh, discourses. They are bureaucratized, and they are uh, also uh, part of the larger neoliberal uh, framework. As such, the focus of safeguarding is rests more readily on the individual child, the parent, the family, rather on the larger uh, social context in which children's lives are lived. The discourse around the universal child also becomes a little problematic because it conceals the fact that certain vulnerable groups of children require different strategies for inclusion. So, uh, like, uh, just to give an example, Article 23 of the UNCRC talks about uh, how a disabled child should enjoy a full and decent life in conditions which ensure dignity, promote self-reliance, and facilitate the child's active participation in the community. But in the same uh, article, there is also uh, uh, the, pro uh, the stipulation that the provisions for inclusions will be subject to availability of resources, which means that a lot of the developing countries will never find the resources for disabled children to ensure their well-being. And that is what is happening mostly in India, where uh, India is a country which has very good policy frameworks. And this I will say with uh, emphasis because almost every international uh, convention that is there, India has signed and ratified. And we have very good policy frameworks. The problem is in the implementation of the policy frameworks and the monitoring of the systems that are set up by the state. So that is where uh, the major problems lie. Now, coming to India particularly, 40% of India's uh, population are children. So that's a very big number. And uh, the, the two main laws that I'll be talking about which concern children in need of uh, care and protection, uh, one is called the Juvenile Justice Act of India, 
Uh, it talks about all children who come under the, uh, uh, into the state system and they are to be cared and looked after by the state. And the second is uh, the act which came in 2012, which is called the POXO Act, the Prevention of Sexual Offenses, uh, Protection of Children uh, from Sexual Offenses Act of 2012. And it talks about uh, fostering a safer environment for all children. So uh, what we see is that uh, despite these laws being there and despite the fact that these laws talk about all children, they do not have provisions that are there specifically for disabled children to cater to the specific requirements of disabled children. So uh, the whole point is that the safety and protection of children of specifically disabled children has now boiled down to CCTV cameras and fire extinguishers. There is nothing more in any of the institutions, and I am talking about entire range of institutions, which includes schools, which in, includes uh, uh, institutions providing services, and a residential institutions. So there's nothing more than uh, these two provisions that we see. Uh, there is another uh, age body that is there in India, which is called the National Commission for the Protection of Rights of the Child. And this NCPCR has issued safety guidelines for all institutions. And it talks about ongoing review and assessment of the safety and security requirements. And it talks about cultures of safety and awareness and vigilance. However, these rules apply only to the mainstream schools and not to institutions that are meant for uh, disabled children or disabled young adults. So what really happens within this system is that with such poor definitions of safety and the very low premium that is pay placed on human life in India in general, the mechanisms for monitoring safety of children, specifically disabled children, who are culturally most undervalued has always remained under discussed. Most schools for disabled children, state run or private, have carved out some kinds of measures to maintain themselves. They try to evade breach of safety. They conceal most of the cases of abuse that happen unless they tremble out into the open. So this is one instance when these, uh, there were the, in West Bengal, uh, these, uh, there were back-to-back -back deaths of two children living, um, attending certain uh, centers or institutions to uh, avail of services. Now, uh, what happened is, uh, and there is a history of other states in India having witnessed similar kind of deaths. So Rajasthan, Kerala, um, uh, Delhi, uh, Maharashtra, there are this entire range of, uh, but, these two cases particularly happened in West Bengal, and uh, what happened really was both the children died because of the negligence of the school authorities. If I'm going to pass, please tell me. Uh, I, I just uh, realized that they are signing, and I, maybe I'm speaking too fast. Uh, <laughs> so just feel free to stop me. <laughs> So what happened is immediately after this incident happened, uh, two networks in West Bengal immediately jumped into action. And who are these two networks? One is the network which is called Parivar Bengal, which is part of the National Confederation of Parents Organizations. So it's basically a family-led organization. And it, uh, it is an organization that has been campaigning for long for the care and protection of persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So for them, the stake was of two uh, uh, at two levels. One is both, in both the cases that the ch children died, parents like themselves were affected. And secondly, many parents ran similar organization or sent their children to such organizations. So they, do, couldn't, uh, uh, they couldn't envisage the closure of such organizations because of the death of the children. So the closure was not an option for most of these parents because this was, this was a place, space where the children could develop as well as it was a place, play, uh, it was a place that provided respite care to parents for some part of the day. And therefore, they wanted the institutions to remain functional while catering to the safety needs of the children. 
The other ne network is uh, called Disability Activist Forum West Bengal. Now, this is a forum that came with the first law, that uh, disability law that was passed in India in 1996. And they are working mainly, they are disability activists, advocates, uh, working for building awareness and engaging in advocacy. So the, 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 this network, for them, the issue of the death of the children was more priority than the maintenance of the uh, organizations. But both of them understood that the issue was not of closing the schools, but to get them to acknowledge and redress the gaps in safety measures. So what they did was they came together and they organized a collective meeting of uh, uh, organizations that work with disabled children, disabled young adults, to discuss safety guidelines. So there were an entire range of uh, people who attended from about 60 organizations. So they were leaders of NGOs uh, working with uh, uh, cross disability groups, parents organizations, special schools, to grassroots level organizations. And the, the, the reason that a lot of these uh, representatives came to this meeting was the fact that they were concerned not just about the death of the disabled children, but also about their own existence, because they were afraid that the state would now st step in and take measures to uh, stop their uh, operations. So they feared that they would be closed down. So the thrust was on maintaining, as uh, uh, my co presenter was, of the halo that they had in the disability uh, and social sector. They were looked upon as providing the most necessary and appropriate support to one of the most disadvantaged groups of society. So what really happened is that in this as a researcher, when I step back, because I was one of the participants there, when you step back, you realize you, that what kind of power equations are going on in that meeting. The big NGOs that worked with disabled people, they immediately said, we have safety policies in place. But we realized after a point of time that these were only guidelines for physical accessibility, and some of them had a visitor policy where uh, they wanted to restrict interaction with the visitors. This was very significant because all organizations, uh, they, they said that they practice safety measures, but actually they have never codified any of these safety measures. Other organizations complained that there were no state directives given for maintaining of safety protocols. And this became very important. The fact that the state in India had never uh, really issued any directives that would promote the safety of children, young adults, in the, uh, within the organizations. Many of the institutions actually expressed that if the state provided safety guidelines, they would be willing to abide by the same. So uh, this was also a way of seeking legitimacy in the eyes of the state and the state government instead of self-regulation for the benefit of the children and the families that they were working in. So the reactions were diverse. There was denial. This will not happen in my place, so I don't need safety guidelines. Uh, we are a small or organization. We don't need safety guidelines. To complacency, we have specific uh, arrangements in place. And all of this was uh, used to rationalize the fact that there were no written safety guidelines in any of the organizations, however big or however small. So this was a reflection of the way in power operates within the disability sector in India, where there is, where, where there is little accountability on part of the NGOs in terms of the provisions of safety. And there is a very feeble voice of disabled people themselves and their families demanding basic requirements because they fear that they would be then uh, bereft of the ser minimum services that they are uh, accessing. Now, this meeting also was a very eye-opener in terms of the power relations that were emerging because a small committee was formed to draft guidelines that all the organizations would abide by, which would provide some guidance on to, about how to provide for safety and uh, well-being of the children that, uh, and the young adults that they worked with. Now, this is very interesting because all the big NGOs 
big in terms of the people they serve, big in terms of financial resources, wanted to be part of that committee because they did not want necessarily to contribute to the safety uh, discussion, but they wanted to see how, um, uh, how the guidelines would not restrict their operations. So that was very interesting. Uh, yeah. But having said that, uh, a lot of these small organizations came up and they started asserting themselves. And these small NGOs were run by parents on a small scale. The, their fear was that stringent safety guidelines would mean the death of their organizations because too many protocols would require heavy financial costs, which they could not uh, countenance. So, you know, what, uh, as a social scientist, if I take Foucault, Foucault's concept of power being everywhere and how power can be um, uh, embodied in discourse, knowledge, and regimes of truth. This is something that we saw in operation. So the process of drafting the guidelines was therefore fraught with struggles of these different groups that wanted their voices represent, represented, but the ability to flag the issues of safety was very limited and the diversity, the experience of diversity was restrictive. So it was a challenging um, uh, exercise because they were cross-disability groups and it was very difficult to accommodate all groups in the same safeguarding um, um, guideline. It was very difficult to uh, do that. So uh, what really happened is we looked at international documents, but some of them were irrelevant just because of the cultural context in which we uh, live in. So um, uh, we really had to look at uh, uh, how these uh, guidelines would be cross-disability, but they would also cater to big organizations and small organizations, how they would cater to uh, all categories of organizations. So um, the safety guidelines was developed by this group of people. And in a way, it was a very balanced document because the big NGOs and the small NGOs balanced each other out. And uh, the parents and the, um, the professionals also balanced each other out. So there was a uh, balance of power that took place. The parameters were discussed and they were built into the guidelines and ultimately it actually became the safety and well-being guidelines rather than just being safety guidelines. The cooperative and collaborative process ensured that the voices of all groups were represented and the concerns of all diverse NGOs were accommodated within the provisions. While the safety guidelines highlighted infrastructural requirements, they also gave emphasis on good and safe practices. So uh, basically the guideline, uh, if I can show you later, is kind of a graded guideline. So if you are a small organization, minimum this must be there. And if you are a big organization, this is the kind of uh, extent that must be there. All the parties acknowledged that the safety guidelines, however, was a living document. That means safety is something that is going to undergo, the notion of safety is going to undergo change. Safety cultures would also undergo change, the idea. So this could be adapted by diverse NGOs as per their needs and would need to be reviewed periodically as the context and requirements of diverse groups of disabled people changed. Several NGOs who were more invested in the process decided to use the guidelines to assess their own safety thresholds and improve their safety practices. With continuing advocacies, these two networks, all uh, Bengal, West Bengal networks, um, convinced the state government to uh, use the guideline. What the state government has done in its capacity, uh, they have sent out the guidelines to all organizations, institutions that work with disabled uh, children and young adults. Yes, uh, I, two minutes. Uh, but the state refuses to take on the monitoring responsibility that they should be taking because private agencies cannot do the monitoring. It is the state that has to take the responsibility of the monitoring. So in conclusion, I want to just make this point that 
In a cultural context where the safety of disabled children is a much ignored issue, the developing of safety cultures becomes very uh, of primary importance, not just as tools that can be used to fix unsafe organizations, but as a commitment towards safety management. This initiative by these networks, uh, though emerging from a need of, uh, for self-preservation, signaled the sense of responsibility towards users of services. Most of the NGOs that were part of this uh, process uh, are the networks which acted as pressure uh, for them to join the movement, but it was also a recognition that the safeguards provided by such an initiative could only be benefit them in the long run. The, thus, the social capital that they had already access to was leveraged in, uh, to project political correctness along with the calculation of the larger benefit that could accrue to them by becoming aware of the safeguarding pro protocols. It also gave us the chance to ensure representation and voice of particular groups and their concerns. Thank you. <laughs>